She was expected home shortly after 2am, but when mother of one, Jaron Lockhart, failed to make it back safely, her fiancé feared the worst. 15 calls later, and her family felt hopeless. And the trail of clues found in the following days painted a very harrowing picture, which included this grainy surveillance footage. But who were these two individuals? Why did Jaron leave work with them? And how were they involved? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffee House Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Jaron Lockhart. Now, one of the most angering things about this story is the sheer pointlessness behind all of it, and how underprepared and disorganized her assailants were. Then again, I'm flying tomorrow and I've not even thought about packing yet, so maybe I'm not one to talk. Anyway, did you know that I post true crime and strange cases here weekly? So if that does sound like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel, it really does help me out. And so with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Jaron Lockhart. As a spoiler alert, our story will eventually take us to the Great Mississippi River, a beauty in its majesty, a beast in its dynamism, and arguably one of the hardest names to spell correctly. To begin with, we must travel downstream to the southern state of Louisiana. And if you can look past the stereotypical and drugged facade of swamps, alligators, and banjos, you'll be pleasantly surprised to find a rich and blended world beneath. Classed as humid subtropical, the Pelican State offers beautiful coastlines and biodiverse marshlands. Plans. And when you step inward to its inland areas, they are dominated by low prairies and rolling hills. Stepping into the metropolitan world, Louisiana is comprised of a blend of Canadian, French, African American, and Spanish communities. Furthermore, if you travel towards the mouth of the Great River, you'll end up in a vibrant city that boasts all of these incredible cultures. And of course, I'm talking about New Orleans. Often referred to as the most unique city in the United States, you are spoiled for choice with the many sights, sounds, and experiences that this eclectic city has to offer. To begin with, did you know that New Orleans is believed to be one of the most haunted cities in America? That's because various wars, slavery, torture, and, of course, murders have taken place here. To add to this, it has one of the largest collections of overground tombs in the country, and voodoo is permanently etched into its history. Moving into our story today, one of those living in this city was a young woman who went by the name of Jack. Aaron Lockhart. However, before we learn of her and her adult years, let's wind the clocks back to where her story began. Born in the year 1989, Jaron entered this world in a small hospital found in Independence, Louisiana. February the 28th was the day her mother, Donna, and father Pete saw her come into this very bizarre world. And coming from a larger family, she had two brothers, Lance and Nick, and three sisters, Nikki, Andrea, and Alyssa. Despite the many siblings, Jaron unfortunately came from a broken home. As a result, and while still a teenager, she moved to Tangi Pahoa Parish. The cards were never in her favor, and sadly, she experienced a rather rough life. She had to grow up fast, and it's heartbreaking to know that she was a regular 14-year-old girl just trying to find someone to take care of her. It was in high school that Jaron found a friend named Katrina Friedman. The two would often stay up late at night writing poetry. Katrina recalls her as smart and very creative. She loved art and loved to write, and it was through her drawings and poetry that Jaron expressed her own feelings. To add to this, she also loved makeup and experimenting with her hair. Friends say that she was always changing her hairstyle style and colour, and often changed it with the seasons. It's in this part of her timeline that she also met her boyfriend of eight years named Jeremy Foster, and moving through the following eight years, the two would eventually have a daughter together named Riley. To say that Jaron was a good mother is an absolute understatement. Pictures of the two portray a mother madly doting on a child she so desperately wanted to provide for. Jaron recognised the shortcomings in her own childhood, and desperately wanted to break the cycle. However, that wouldn't come too easy, because education was tough. After getting a GED, which is a general equivalency diploma for those of you outside of America, Jaron then attended a local cosmetology school. Moving into the year 2011, Jaron was a 22-year-old mother to a 3-year-old daughter, and although she wasn't necessarily financially stable, she had a rich life filled with friends and family. To quote those that knew her, she was somebody you would always want to be around, and everybody loved Jaron. 
She was this happy small bundle of energy. However, as you can likely imagine, life was not particularly easy for her, and from the year 2009 onwards, she started to work at Stiletto's Bar on Bourbon Street followed by Temptations, which was a local gentleman's club. Jaren would dance here to get by, quitting whenever Jeremy got himself a well-paid job and rejoining again whenever those contracts fell through. And so, over the following years, she was in and out of the industry. By the summer of 2012, Jaren and Jeremy were once again down on their luck. They were living in a $50 per night motel near Tulane Avenue, while their daughter remained safe in the hands of her grandmother. Stating the potentially obvious here, but the dancing industry comes with a whole repertoire of inherent risks, especially when dancers agree to work at private parties to supplement their income. Now, Jaren never agreed to take on any of these undue dangers. She never accepted private events, never left with strangers, and never exchanged sex for cash. Money had always been an underlying issue, but her priorities remained at home with Jeremy and Riley. All of us come from different backgrounds, and we're dealt different cards in very different orders, and it's clear to see that for Jaren, she never had the winds of good fortune in her sails. She was a young woman, often down on her luck, and just like many of us, this sometimes forces us to make bad or miscalculated decisions sometimes simply because it's the overwhelmingly easy option. Now, these decisions don't necessarily define who we are. Just because I decided to wear blue today doesn't mean that blue's my favourite colour, that I'll only wear blue, or that it defines me. It's just a fleeting decision. However, that is not to say that these momentary decisions don't come with their own individual, random and unpredictable consequences. And tragically, in June 2012, Jaron Lockhart would fall into a very terrible outcome. It was a Wednesday, and another warm evening in New Orleans. Following a rather lacklustre shift, Jaren was disappointed with her earnings, and with barely any tips coming through that evening, she hadn't made much extra cash. That was when two familiar faces walked in towards the very end of her shift. The man, named Terry Speaks, and his partner, Margaret Sanchez, had known her for a while, and therefore were likely trusted. The two had a proposition for Jaren. Nothing too adventurous, though. They were hosting a private party that night and wanted some entertainment. And so they asked Jaren if she wanted to earn some extra money. Jump in, dance for an hour, and then leave. It seemed as if Jaren had at least entertained the idea, because at 2am that morning, security cameras captured her leaving Temptation's Gentleman's Club with Terry and Margaret by her side. However, to add whiplash to this story, these surveillance images would be the last time Jaren was ever recorded alive, because after this moment, none of her friends or family would ever hear from her again. Into the darkness of night, she walked, never to come out of it alive. When Jaren failed to return home that evening, Jeremy immediately knew something was wrong. For her to just disappear like this was extremely out of character. Over the next few hours, both Jeremy and his father tried to call a total of 15 times. However, every phone call went straight through to voicemail. Without being able to establish any form of contact, and after several agonizing hours, Jeremy finally decided to notify the police. An official missing persons report was filed, and after Jaren's family and friends learned of her absence, both anxiety and concern erupted in the social circle. And as her disappearance turned from hours into days, other events were simultaneously happening over on the Gulf Coast. At around 5.30pm on June the 7th, beach walkers came across a gruesome discovery. The dismembered torso of a woman had been washed ashore by the tide. Though the torso was noted to have three piercings, and it appeared to belong to a young woman. Interesting side note for those who remember my video on this case, but the body was initially suspected to belong to Michaela Shunnick, who had been missing for one week when the torso was found. Though, days later, this was swiftly ruled out by investigating officers. Two days later, on June the 9th, another awful discovery was made. Reports of a severed leg on the beach of Pass Christian came in. Once reports of this were confirmed, the news spurred officers to search further afield. And as a result of this investigation, more body parts were found between Bay St. Louis and Long Beach. This included a head, two arms, and the other leg. With so many body parts washed ashore, police officers now had the gruesome job of piecing the victim back together. By 
By now, Jaren's disappearance was connected to the case, and sadly, it was likely that the mutilated body belonged to her. Saying that, it would take investigators quite a while to identify her. It also looked like a lot of effort had been put in to removing identifiable features such as tattoos. However, due to the piercings located on the body, it was strongly believed to belong to her. And after finding her clothes nearby in Long Beach, all hope was lost. The clothing she'd been wearing in that surveillance video matched those that were found. With this shocking news, Jaren's community began to mourn their loss. Needless to say, Jeremy was in despair at the discovery. Jaren's death marked the end of his old way of living, as it marked the end of Riley's life with a mother. Autopsy reports concluded that the wound to her chest, likely from a knife, was the cause of her death. The reports also confirmed that opiates were found in her system. To add to this, there was no DNA evidence found that could link her to her killers. However, it was at this point in the investigation that officers found something abnormal while reviewing all surveillance footage in the local area. The security camera at Temptations revealed that Jaren had, in fact, left the club with a couple. Additional surveillance footage confirmed that the pair had been sleuthing Bourbon Street clubs all night prior, randomly asking different dancers to go home with them. After learning of these concerning details, NOPD released this surveillance footage to the public, requesting for any information which may help Help identify these individuals. As it turns out, two other dancers were propositioned before Jaren. This included Lacey Dillman, who was offered $700 to perform at a bachelor party. Apparently, the pair had a very strange demeanor, and after being creeped out by them, she declined their offer. Sadly, this is where Jaren's luck ran out. As we know, it was a very poor night for tips, and after worrying about not being able to make the rent, she jumped at the opportunity. After identifying these two as Terry Speaks and Margaret Sanchez, the authorities obtained a search warrant for their property. And after going inside, that's where all the evidence started to piece together. As the authorities questioned local neighbors, fresh information came to light. One of them had witnessed Terry dragging multiple garbage bags out of the house that night. According to the neighbor, he was struggling to lift the bags. The neighbor spotted at least three or four big ones and could smell bleach emanating from the property. Now, nearby residents were frequently perplexed when it came to the pair. Margaret was often described as socially strange. She was often seen wearing long dresses and high heels with a top hat and a fanny pack. She was referred to as outlandish, and brought a weirdness to the Stilettos Club. While Margaret was, well, weird, Terry was dangerous. And little did his neighbors know that he was actually a wanted man on the East Coast for various reasons. One of his most serious felonies stemmed from a 2003 conviction in North Carolina for having sexual relations with a minor. In the years that followed, he violated his probation and twice failed to register as a sex offender, which of course was a requirement for his 2003 conviction. Margaret and Terry were a couple and had been romantically involved with each other ever since the year 2009. And the the reason they both knew Jaren was because they had worked with her three years prior. All three had worked at Stilettos on Bourbon Street in the year 2009, the same year Jaren herself began dancing. And side note, but Margaret was known as Margot Stars, while Terry was nicknamed Alan Rice. While Margaret was a dancer, Terry worked as a doorman, ironically often walking dancers to their cars after work as a matter of safety. He also worked as a barker, trying to lure potential customers in through the club's front doors. Moving into what officers could piece together that night, Jaron, Terry, and Margaret were captured walking out of Temptations Bar. About 23 minutes later, a license plate recognition camera located in Kenner recorded Terry's car pass by. It is thought that, after managing to get Jaron into their home located nearby, they pinned her down before stabbing her in the heart. After committing the terrible crime, they stole her mobile phone and turned it off, rendering authorities unable to trace or track her movement. And once she was dead, they cut her up into multiple pieces, severing her limbs and head from her torso. At around 9.30pm, almost one day after Jaren was spotted walking out of Temptations with them, a license plate camera on Interstate 10 captured Terry's car crossing into Mississippi. And about 90 minutes later, that same vehicle was captured re-entering Louisiana. 
It is believed that Terry and Margaret later drove to Hancock County, where they then threw the last of her remains off the Bay St. Louis Bridge. Possibly believing they would avoid any suspicion, all of that would change just several days later. And as the state of Louisiana and afar learned of their names and faces, the authorities would then pay them and their home a little visit. Well, neighbors tell us that this is where Margaret Sanchez lived. Take a look behind me. Police are actually searching this home as we speak right now. If you can see, there are members of Kenner Police Department. Also, there are bags of evidence right there in front of the house, and a dog, a cadaver dog, actually just came out of the backyard. So they are actively searching the scene, uh, removing evidence as we speak. We did speak with some neighbors who said that the couple had lived here for a while. She had lived here much longer. He had just recently moved here in the last year or so, and that they were quiet and kept to themselves for the most part. They did see them more in the evening. Now, the neighbors tell us that this is unbelievable. And in fact, even though that they hadn't met them very much, that when they saw the surveillance video on television, that they knew immediately that that was indeed Terry Speaks. Again, neighbors don't know the couple very well, but they said they have seen them. And again, as we are live here in Kenner, investigators on the scene removing evidence related possibly, they think, to the to the murder of 22-year-old Jaron Lockhart. So, of course, this is a developing story. We will have the latest as soon as it becomes available. I'm Rachel Wolf, reporting live from Kenner. Back to you now in the studio. Following the surveillance footage, witness reports, and the search of the property, authorities had a fairly good idea of what happened to Jaron. And so, with that said, an arrest warrant was made. Now, I can imagine that, first and foremost, you are probably looking for a motive here. However, unfortunately, you're not going to find that in the story, because, as it turns out, there doesn't appear to be one. As expected, both pleaded not guilty to their charges, and so a trial was scheduled. Margaret's bond was set at $750,000, meanwhile Terry's was set at $1.75 million. With Terry failing to register as a sex offender in Louisiana, he now faced these extra charges too and after being shipped back to North Carolina, he pleaded guilty to those lesser charges. As it turns out, while serving time for this, he then confessed about murdering Jaron to two other inmates, who several days later ratted him out. I often find these inmate confessions absolutely ridiculous. I mean, why would you trust them with a secret? If you can't trust your family and friends with something so important, then why are you going to trust a stranger who is also a criminal? Anyway, what happened next was quite surprising. But after the court was accused of violating their own guidelines, Margaret's bond was reduced to $35,000. To add to all of this, without any clear evidence linking Margaret to Jaron's murder, she was eventually released from prison in August 2012. She was rearrested nine months later in May 2013, and after finally being put back behind bars, Margaret Sanchez was once again faced with second-degree murder charges. And with Kenner Police Department assuming the investigation, a trial was now formally underway for both suspects. So, a substantial amount of evidence was already available for the prosecution. But what do you think ultimately sealed their fate? Well, the answer may surprise you because, as it would turn out, it would be their very own emails. In fact, stupidly enough, hundreds were sent back and forth between the pair, with most of them being during the time that Terry was already behind bars and Margaret remained free. To quote a few of these emails, one from Terry said, You're the one they'll fry and not me. Remember the boots? Remember the panties? Do you remember what you were wearing? Shall I go on? So I mentioned this the other week in another case, but I always find it fascinating how couples turn on each other when they stand trial, and this story is absolutely no different. In a jail phone call between the two, Terry said to Margaret, I sit here in prison, keeping you out of prison, and you're going to marry someone else? I am not going to live with this shit anymore. Am I going to live with the guilt inside of me for you? Fuck that shit. In other emails, both Terry and Margaret accuse each other of being deceptive, and question if they should even be talking to each other. It seemed as if his time behind bars was playing with Terry's patience, as over time, his emails became increasingly aggressive. In one email he said, 
see Margot Stars, I'm just as crazy as you. I am the only reason you're still out there free. Where's the gratitude for me? It was ultimately concluded that the two star-crossed lovers would have their own separate trials. Now, this was likely intentional, to allow both of them to become courtroom adversaries to each other. Of course, with one blaming the other over Jaren's death. The jury also saw photographs of Terry and Margaret taken on a beach where the parts of Jaren's body were found. The photographs had been taken a month before she was killed, and were deleted less than two days after. Interestingly, investigators could not find Jaren's DNA in the house. Neither was her DNA found in a pile of burned items outside. There could be several reasons for this. Natural factors such as moisture, heat, and sunlight could have prevented analysts from picking up any usable DNA samples. So, without any strong DNA evidence, it looks like their own bickering was what tipped the scales of justice. Because on June the 19th, 2015, Terry Speaks was found guilty of murder in the second degree of Jaron Lockhart, and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. By the way, he initially tried tried to represent himself in the trial, but after only one day, he handed his case back to his defense attorneys. Likely because he finally realized that his own confidence was incorrectly placed. Following the trial's outcome, Margaret didn't seem too confident either, and in the end, on June the 20th, 2016, she pleaded guilty to participating in Jaron's death. She was eventually sentenced to 40 years for manslaughter, 40 years for obstruction of justice, and 20 years for the charge of conspiracy to obstruct justice. Justice. The three sentences are the maximum for each of the respective charges, with the sentences to be run consecutively. In court today, 32-year-old Margaret Sanchez said she participated in the killing of Jaron Lockhart and then helped dismember her body and dump it in the Gulf. And a judge accepted her guilty plea to manslaughter, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy to obstruct justice. Sanchez had been a suspect since just days after Lockhart's torso was found washed up on a beach in Bay St. Louis. Her boyfriend at the time, Terry Speaks, was convicted of second-degree murder and other related charges just last year. But today was the first time either of them admitted to the murder. You know, my head is actually really struggling to get around Margaret's legal journey. To be arrested, and then her bond increased to a million dollars, then to be reduced to $250,000, and then $35,000, and then to be released, but then to be rearrested again. Honestly, what? And after taking a plea deal, she was given 100 years behind bars, which theoretically means life. So why even bother to begin with? Anyway, with both suspects being given such sentences, neither will ever see the light of day again or at least not as a free person. I guess one other side note, but Jaren's family and friends were rather upset with how the media portrayed her as a person. Jaren was not a stripper, and to add to this, she was much more than just a dancer too. Put simply, words cannot express the pain her family and friends have endured since her murder. Riley still cries over the loss of her mother and their family is forever broken. Jaren's death will have a huge impact on them for the rest of their lives, and it's infuriating that, even to this day, no known motive exists. Jaren was stuck between a rock and a hard place for most of her life. It sounds cliche, but easy never came easy. Yet despite always swimming upstream, she did the very best she could to always make the most of her situation. She was caring, nurturing, self-aware, and, above all else, a brilliant mother. To quote one of Jaren's last posts on Facebook, I am working every day toward my legacy. It has error, but each mistake has been priceless to the journey. I wouldn't exchange my past experiences for the world. They are what have shaped me. Every trial, every struggle, every heartbreak, every broken dream, every crushed hope, and every loss has helped me grow mentally and spiritually. I am my own person. I am not the product of anyone else's doing. And if you think you can judge me, think again. Because I am nothing you have ever seen before. I am me. And so goes the case of Jaron Lockhart. I think I'm wrapping this one up here, folks. Thank you so much for being here with me for another video today about Coffeehouse Crime. I really do appreciate it. So, what do you think about this case? I know there was barely any DNA evidence to link Terry and Margaret to Jaron's murder, 
but do you think there was enough peripheral evidence to link them to the crime? As always, please let me know what you think in the comments down below. I do try to read most of my comments, and I really do appreciate it. Just a very quick message as well that I still have a giveaway going on my social media profile, so if you are interested, please check out my Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. That's at Coffeehouse Crime on Instagram and Facebook, and Coffee H Crime on Twitter. To add to that, if you'd like early access to my videos, merchandise, exclusive content, membership to my Discord, or just to support me in the channel, Channel, please check out my Patreon. If you found the video interesting, please like the video. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.